Okay, who's uh, who's heard me uh, before here? Anybody? Oh, okay. All right. Well, as uh, Chris said, uh, I'm having bonus content about the uh, Chinese balloons, spy balloons. Um, and my sister, who's a high school French teacher, she said all your uh, presentations don't start with humor. You've got to hook your audience in with humor. <laughs> she should know. She deals with dealt with high school kids, and so here's my humor. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was a great balloon. So uh, okay, but the question is about my yeah. talk. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Why did Japan send 9,300 paper balloons against North America in World War II? Well, in one word, they could. Well, sure. yeah, everybody could. But the main word, reason was revenge. I have a feeling a lot of you have seen 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, which was basically a propaganda stunt. Franklin Roosevelt wanted to firm up sagging American morale at the start of the war. So he got the Army and Navy together and they flew off Army bombers from an aircraft carrier that bombed Japan. Didn't do much damage. However, or physical damage, let me put it that way. But what was damaged was the Japanese self-esteem. Their emperor back then was considered a god. The nation of Japan was the sacred homeland of that god. The army and navy of Japan failed in protecting it. So they wanted to get back. They had a problem. Uh, they didn't have the means, conventional means, for revenge retaliation raids. And I'll get into that in a second. Okay. Uh, there's been a couple of movies. Okay, by the way, I'm a movie fan. So that's how I relate to things. There was a really terrible movie in the 70s about Midway. Uh, had Charlton Heston and a bunch of other people. The more recent one that came out about five, six years ago had Woody Harrelson as Admiral Nimitz. That was better. But the problem for the Japanese by getting set back at Michigan was that there was no way they could move eastward against the United States. The Japanese told that they take Midway, then they can take Hawaii, then they have a base state at the U.S. Well, that wasn't going to happen. So the Japanese had to use unconventional means. All right, before I go into that, um, Japan's strategic situation. Why did they go to war to begin with? Uh, Japan has only two things in great numbers. People and uh, land that's not good for anything. Uh, not a whole lot of minerals, not a whole lot of space for grow growing things. So the Japanese go, all right, we're going to be like our European buddies. We're going to take over China and get all of their uh, resources. Well, the U.S. didn't like that. We put an embargo on Japan for oil and other resources, and our buddies, the French and the British and the Dutch in their colonies, they did the same thing. Well, the Japanese goes, all right, well, we're going to take this stuff. Well, the problem is to take the colonies in Southeast Asia, they had to go right by the Philippines, which the U.S. had essentially colonized. So the Japanese go, okay, the way we're going to do that is hit the Americans at Pearl Harbor. They're not going to have a fleet to take back what we've conquered. And so this red line here is the extent of Japanese conquest. Their strategy was essentially defensive. The Americans will impale themselves on our defenses. They get tired and uh, they're wimpy. So uh, they'll impale themselves and they'll sue for peace eventually and we can keep all this stuff that we gained in our initial offenses. Okay, the problem is 
They have no airplanes that can go all the way against the U.S. Um, what they did have was giant submarines. And until our nuclear boats in the late 50s, 60s, these were the biggest submarines that were ever built. This part right here held, held an airplane, but they had to assemble it. Uh, they had to take the wings off, take the floats off, they assembled it on the surface, and then they would shoot it off from a catapult. Uh, this was originally for scouting for their fleet. The Japanese goes, well, our plane's going to go bomb the U.S. Well, as you can see, it's a one-engine plane, doesn't carry much. So they did send a couple out, drop some uh, incendiaries, didn't do much damage. So they go, let's go back to the drawing boards. Oh yeah, also, uh, during the war, the Japanese Army told the Navy, use these submarines to resupply our island bases. So that was out of the picture. Okay, military researchers at an institute in Noborito, Japan, came up with a very unique and novel weaponry, unarmed bomb-carrying balloons. Um, and so this was known as the Fugo weapon. Well, what pray tell is a Fugo? All right, Fu is the 32nd character in the Japanese syllabulary or alphabet. Go was their equivalent for number. So strictly speaking, Fugo meant it was weapon number 32 of this research laboratory. But also, it was the first part of the word fusen, which is Japanese for balloon. So it was basically the balloon weapon. Okay, now it's physics time. All right. When you have a balloon and it's enclosed, now these are not hot air balloons. These are balloons that they're totally encased like a balloon you blow up. Uh, and if you have a balloon at altitude, if nothing happens to it, the sun is going to expand the gas that is already in the balloon and if nothing happens, the balloon will pop. And then in the nighttime, the gas will cool, and if nothing happens, it will drop back to Earth. So the key thing is keeping it up at a good altitude. So what is a good altitude? Well, it's above 30,000 feet. Why is it a good altitude at that time? You've all seen on the Weather Channel in your nightly newscast, here's where the jet stream goes. This is down here. This is the jet stream basically for the 1940s. Nowadays, with climate change, it's really screwy. Uh, and the jet stream is a high-altitude river of wind in the northern hemisphere going east. And it travels at 120 miles an hour. Now, when my brother came back from Vietnam, his plane landed an hour early because the jet stream was particularly strong that day. So you have to keep the balloon up at this altitude where you see the little balloon images. And hopefully after 50 to 60 hours, it'll drop bombs on North America. Okay, how does it stay at the right altitude? Okay. You have a balloon, as I said, there's nothing at the bottom. I mean, it's enclosed at the bottom. And you have a little valve down here. Uh, the balloon is about 30 feet across, the size of a current hot air balloon. You have shroud lines going down to what the Canadians call the chandelier or payload. And I'll talk about in detail what's in the payload. Particular attention, are up here and then down here. This is a fuse that goes up to the envelope of the balloon and it has a self-destruct bomb on it. And uh, if things go as uh, 
plan, the balloon will drop its bombs, set out a fuse to light this bomb, and it will explode the envelope. Prior to that, another bomb explodes the chandelier. Uh, so if it works as advertised in some scene, and when you look up at an airliner up in the sky with the contrails, it's kind of hard to even see the jet airliner. You can see the contrails, but not the actual airplane. So uh, if anybody sees anything, it's going to be a flash in the sky, and you're going to go, what's that? Okay, to release the gas in the daytime, they have a very simple uh, release valve that when it gets to a certain pressure, it will open up like you see there and vent a little amount of gas so the balloon stays at the right altitude. It's quite simple. More complicated is the device that keeps the balloon from falling to the earth. And here we have the chandelier. Uh, it has three parts. The first part is a clear plastic box made of Bakelite. Does anybody remember Bakelite? Okay, for those of you who don't, it was a first kind of plastic. And most Bakelites, the most people in the U.S. saw were radios made of it, and they could be a very bright color. So, Chris, do you have anything with Bakelite in the museum here? Do you know? Okay. Uh, but the Japanese had a clear plastic box. How come? <clears throat> it contained salt water, and then they put a battery there where the red arrow is. That is to power the mechanism that will drop first the sandbags and then the bombs. Uh, right below it are barometers that they use for certain aspects of launching and keeping the balloon at, at the proper height. And then below that is a ring and uh, connected to the battery are a number of wires that goes to these little what they call blowout plugs, which are essentially shotgun shells. It's okay, so what happens when the balloon goes below 30,000 feet? The barometer will pick that up, it will flip a switch, and it will shoot out the blowout plug first on one side, and then on the other so the balloon is kept even. And when all of the sandbags are dropped from these blowout plugs, then they will drop bombs. Uh, and then after the last bomb is dropped, it will set a fuse off. I uh, can't see if there, you can see the self-destruct bomb, but it's on the chandelier. Uh, so it's kind of complex, a Rube Goldberg thing. This looks very, well, this is simplified, but in real life, this is what it looked like, a bunch of spaghetti streams. This is a high explosive bomb. That's 33 pounds of high explosive. To the left of it, a canister, that's incendiary, that's 11 pounds. And here is the sandbag. Uh, these are naval aviators. How do we know they're naval aviators? They had these spiffy green, gray green uniforms in World War II. Uh, and actually, a naval aviator can still wear them, but generally speaking, it's another uniform you have to buy. Most of them pass on. Okay, here is a balloon found in British Columbia in Canada, and you can see all the fuses. Um, so, you know, when uh, the investigators first saw these, they were really quite perplexed. What in God's name is this thing? Okay, the thing I like about this, Boundary Bay, British Columbia, a Japanese balloon landed at a Royal Canadian Air Force base. Pure luck. Wow. On that. Okay, the American investigators, they got a complete chandelier, they put it in a high altitude chamber, and this is from a movie, it shows uh, sandbags being dropped. I assume they just armed these incendiary bombs. 
Uh, the Japanese bombs, according to the World War II bomb disposal expert, the Allied experts, they were really tricky at all times. Uh, very unstable. Okay, they dropped 32 sandbags, and you'd set up, uh, you know, they would drop all these, then they would drop the bombs. First, a bomb, uh, self destruct bomb would destroy the chandelier, then another bomb would destroy the envelope. Envelope, it would be unseen and quite mysterious. Why are you dropping sand bombs? Well, sand if they're not, okay, you're dropping the sandbags to make the balloon rise up to the proper altitude. Okay, okay. yeah, sorry I didn't make that clear, but yeah, you drop the sandbags. I mean, they're not really a weapon unless one lands on you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> on that. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, thanks, thanks for um, having me point that out for you. Okay, uh, this seems to be a lot of effort for a tiny amount of damage. Of course, as we said, if like a sandbag or a high explosive bomb drops on you, that's bad news. But overall, uh, that doesn't seem to be a lot of bang for the buck, as they used to say. Uh, and this confused the Americans and the Canadians a lot. Why are they doing this? And after the war, we interviewed the Japanese researchers, but we didn't find a lot of their documents because the Japanese had one month from when they surrendered before MacArthur took over, and they destroyed a lot of their documents. But some weren't destroyed. Grandpa kept some documents up in the attic. Grandpa dies. The family goes, we don't want this stuff. We don't know what it is. So they put it out in flea markets in the, in the 90s. And soon people realized these are authentic documents. And the Japanese did, in fact, have another weapon they could use. And that was a chemical weapon. Um, and from this New York Times article, they wanted to carry disease, but the prime general in Japanese army, Tojo, he said no, because we are defending islands, Japan is a series of islands, we can't run away from poison gas or chemical weapons, uh, we would be sitting ducks. So he said at the last minute, no, no germ or chemical weapons. But basically these balloons were designed for that, so they had to fall back on conventional weapons. Okay, uh, one problem the Japanese had was that they didn't have a whole lot of natural resources. Almost everything had to be imported. So. The, when the Japanese army said, okay, maybe we'll go with balloons, but you guys have to use materials that are non-strategic. You can't use rubber, for instance. And most balloons back then were, you know, made with rubber. So the Japanese had a crash program in paper making, and they have centuries old knowledge about paper making. And they had a special mulberry paper that wasn't used for anything else. So they used it to make the skin of the balloon, the envelope. Uh, here we have, uh, and they, they had cottage industries. They farmed these out to small enterprises. Here, and women were pretty much used for this. Here is a Japanese soldier overseeing that. Uh, this is part of the paper making process. Uh, and they had enough sheets for 10,000 balloons. You can imagine how much they had. And I forget how many sheets you needed uh, for your average balloon. Okay. Now, what they had to do was paste together a bunch of sheets together to make a real sturdy skin. It's a laminate. And of course, if you have just one sheet of paper, it's easy to tear. But if you have 
two or three pieces of paper is harder to tear. So they enlisted the schoolgirls as part of their compulsory wartime work. Uh, World War II in our high schools and grade schools, the kids did volunteer war work, but it wasn't part of their curriculum. They did about four hours a day doing this. And they did it in a room where they had the windows closed because you know what happens when you open a door in a room with a lot of paper, it blows away. You know, they had to wear sweatbands. Uh, and of course they had women do it because we all know that women have really nimble fingers uh, on that. They had to paste it together with, uh, from a vegetable that was related to arrowroot in the U.S. It was edible. And these kids and their family were on such tight rations that the girls tried to pilfer out the paste. But they pasted together enough uh, sheets for 10,000 balloons. And nobody knew why they were doing this. They were just told, this is your war work, do it. And they speculated, but uh, I don't know if very few people thought this was a weapon to be sent against the U.S. Okay, here is a test inflation of a balloon. And once they had pasted them together and sewed it together, they shellacked it with persimmon juice as a sealant. Now you've seen in little tiki bars, those umbrellas, and sometimes you might have seen in a gift shop a little bigger Japanese umbrella made out of paper. This is what made it weatherproof. Uh, and here we have a test inflation in a sumo wrestling uh, facility. They did it in movie houses. And uh, if they found any leaks, they circled it, and then they would go back and, and paste reinforcing sections on that. Um, okay. It took the Japanese about two years to develop these, and um, it eventually became a joint Army-Navy project. They started out with the Army doing its own, the Navy doing its own, the Navy had a more sophisticated balloon, but it was made out of rubber, which was not strategic. Well, it was strategic, so they couldn't really use it. But this chap in the dark uniform, he's a sailor, and these guys are soldiers. So the guys are manhandling that. So by November of 44, the Japanese are ready. They're not going to use chemical weapons. They're going to use regular uh, bombs. This is what a launch site looked like. It is on the main island of Honshu on the east coast. Um, and actually, okay, can anybody see the green light? Any, oh, there we go. Oh, my light screwed up. There we go. Okay. The uh, balloons are staked down, as you see in the left. You have these huge tanks of hydrogen. They fill up these smaller canisters, and that's how they fill up the balloon. They stake the balloon down. It's on a little carriage. And then the balloon gets to be almost three-quarters filled. And they're not going to fill it all the way because they know the gas is going to expand. And then they... Uh, undo the stakes, and they just let the balloon fly up very silently. Anybody been at a hot air balloon launch at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's noiseless outside of the, uh, the uh, propane flame going up, and this time it's completely silent. And you can see a couple of these balloons in the background. Now, at the start, they had some problems with static electricity, and they had some explosions. So it could be the Japanese maybe lost more people launching the balloons than they ever killed in North America. Um, the crews remember this as being strangely beautiful because they had to launch the balloons when it was calm. And that's after, can you hear me okay? Okay. 
it was after the passage of a weather front. So that's usually it's calm in the evening or in the morning. And so you have either sunrise or sunset, the skies are kind of blue, I mean not blue, red, purple, orange, and they just launch up silently like big jellyfish. And it was you know, memorable, strangely uh, uh, beautiful. Okay, here is a Fugo balloon photographed by uh, an Allied aircraft over the Pacific. They launched 9,300 of these from November of 44 to April of 45. Now the Japanese thought they would have a 10% success rate. So they thought maybe a thousand balloons would get to the US. And if only one landed and caused a forest fire that took place like in Oregon in the, during the Depression, they would consider it worth it. Um, but I want you to uh, consider something. November 44, April 45. That is not an optimal time to try to set fire to forests. But they had the weapons, and so they were ordered to use them. What the Japanese didn't know was that their battery box, the antifreeze water, the salt water, was not strong enough to protect the battery. So with the battery not working, the fuses for those uh, blowout plugs or shotgun shells didn't work. Sandbags were not dropped. So most of the uh, balloons landed in the ocean, as this one did. This is in April 45, very close to when they quit launching them. Now, does that look like a paper balloon to you? These were very sturdy things. In fact, one of the investigators, he kept a uh, part of one of the um, balloon envelopes, and he would have bar bets with people. He would say, you, you, you think you're a strong man? See if you can tear this uh, paper. And, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wet it for you. I'm going to drop some beer down and wet it and see if you can tear it. The, thing, the actual paper got stronger when it was moist. So, you know, these are pretty sturdy things. And uh, almost 300 were discovered during the war. And there are definitely more out there. Every couple of years, somebody stumbles across these. And, all right, you have bombs that are like 80 years old. Um, and in Europe, both the French and Belgian governors, governments, still have explosive ordnance details for the World War I shells. So these things can be potent and they're very unstable. Um, okay. If you would place a map of the population densities in North America, you would see, all right, I'm not getting this thing to work at all. you would see that where the balloons were found corresponded to where people lived. And the West is, is a big place. In fact, uh, every now and then you find, oh, this plane that crashed one mile from its air base in 1945, and we couldn't find it back then, they, you know, they found it in like 1980. Very rugged. So there, there's balloons out there, I'm sure of it. Okay, the balloons landed, you can see on the map, as far south as Mexico, as far south of Whitehorse in the Canadian Yukon, and as far east as Michigan. And I will get into the Michigan ones a little later. Okay, uh, we have now left Japan, we have crossed the Pacific, we are in North America. Um, there was great cooperation between the U.S. and Canada. They had full information sharing. And in the U.S., the responsibilities was that the Navy uh, looked after balloons that were over water and the Army over land. 
And who remembers J. Edgar Hoover? <laughs> yeah, well, J. Edgar said these could carry saboteurs. So I'm, I'm in on the investigations too. My FBI boys, the good draft, I mean the, uh, the uh, competent uh, investigators will help, help you Army guys out. Um, okay. One of the countermeasures was to have radar installations. Uh, they did them along the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. Anybody go out there? Pretty, pretty uh, isolated beaches, especially back in the 40s. Uh, they set up these radar facilities after the Japanese quit launching them. Um, but we didn't know that. And another thing is, is that these balloons didn't have that much metal, and radar works when you have metal. Okay. Another countermeasure, a little more dramatic, is interception. Here we have a Royal Canadian Air Force uh, Tomahawk. It's the P-40 of the Flying Tigers flu. Notice that the Canadians used the British roundels. They adopted the maple leaf after the war. Um, the balloon was shot down right at the international borders. Uh, the interception I really like happened in March of 45 by a Canso aircraft, this is the Canadian version of the Catalina. Uh, this flying boat is on a regular patrol in March and it sees a Japanese balloon close to shore. And you can't see it too well in this photo. Uh, what you can see quite well is the trail of the flare that they launched. And what they did was they flew close to the balloon and kind of blew, blew it over land. And yeah, you can see the trees now and it landed very close to their base. But we're talking about Canada. Guess what happened that night? There was a big blizzard, and it took them you know, four or five days to finally get up there and get the balloon because of all the snow. So this was a shoot down without any weapons used. Um, the best countermeasure we had was investigation. This is one of the first ones in um, Newcastle, Wyoming. Um, you see these soldiers in some kind of gym showing how big it is, and again, it looks like an aluminum balloon. But the gym they're in is all decked out for a party. I just wonder what kind of party they had in there, but anyway. Um, here is a Canadian recovery of a balloon snagged on some trees. Uh, this is in Glacier National Park. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to uh, do some research at the Montana Historical Society. And in the official documents, the Park Service people goes, well, our, our guys found this balloon here. But they had work details of conscientious objectors. And back in the uh, early 90s, they had a reunion of these people and they did oral history. And the conscientious objector work crew said, we were the ones who discovered Uh, this one was pure blind luck how it was discovered. Uh, you've probably seen on, I think it's the History Channel, the Ice Road Truckers series. Well, before they had roads that they could actually have a semi truck on in the wintertime, out west they had tractor trains that went over lakes bringing supplies to various activities. And it just so happened this balloon here landed close to the route of one of the tractor trains. If the balloon had landed in another lake, nobody would have found it because in the springtime the lake would have melted. Okay, technical analysis was very important. We had to figure out how these crazy things ticked. Um, one interesting thing is the sandbags actually convinced a lot of people that the balloons came from Japan because when the launch crews came, they didn't cart sand to a beach. They just went to the beach and dug up the sand 
and uh, put it in the sandbags. Well, in the pre-war time, scientists would collaborate with their peers in other countries. Um, and in this case, the geologists would exchange samples. So we gave Japanese samples of our sand, and they gave us samples of their sand. And by analyzing the, uh, the sand, they found little shells specific to Japan, and they also found little grains of rice that they sprouted. And they said, oh yeah, this is Japanese rice. So the investigation was on that detail, and they figured, yep, this comes from Japan. Um, there is a threat with incendiaries. We wondered why are they sending these things in the middle of the winter time, but we have to make sure that we can cover it. And uh, you notice in this one balloon, we have two incendiary bombs. They're 11 pounds. Um, this is what a full incendiary looked like. There's the interior of it. And there is one incendiary that had uh, sparked off. Um, and an uh, interesting thing, and the balloon that actually got me onto this whole thing landed where I used to live in Colorado. And I was talking to the farmer, and even, even in the um, Army documents, they said that the balloon would shoot out bigger sparks to set fires away from the balloons. Okay. Now, so we're discovering balloons and incendiaries, even though it's the winter time. And most of the western U.S. and Canada has big forests. And again, the fire danger was non-existent for the time of year they were launching them. And really, April to September was the most dangerous <coughs> period, so the Japanese kept launching these. It would be a major problem. And the summer wind might bring more balloons to Canada and the U.S. And they had developed uh, what they called incendiary leaves, which were uh, uh, cardboard uh, dipped in phosphorus, and they thought that per, uh, as a particular danger. So what are we going to do about it? Well, in Canada, they just told the provinces, that's your problem, you take care of it. But in the U.S., we had a special task force called the Firefly Project, which had uh, light observation planes like Piper Cubs, and we had a parachute unit. And um, this is a firefighting parachute, and it is designed to keep the parachutist as high as possible so the parachutist does not go straight into the fire. Close enough, but not into it. Well, who are we going to use for uh, the parachutists? Well, we had the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion. It was all black. Uh, despite the casualties the parachutists had during the war, they did not release them for combat, so they were available. And they were sent out and fought fires in the uh, U.S. West. None of them were caused by balloons. Um, and they had to relearn to use a, a smoke jumper chute because the military chutes had to come down as quick as possible because people are shooting at you. Okay. Damage caused by balloons or by fire? Absolutely nothing because they quit launching these in 45. Now, the final threat is chemical biological warfare. We did not know that the Japanese were not going to use it. We had to operate on what we knew about. And the Bakelite box that had the water for antifreeze, we thought, well, maybe the Japanese put germs or chemicals in there and the uh, water would keep these things potent. And we came up with a list of things that can make people sick. And also a list of things that can make animals sick. 
Now, this is a potent threat because the medical and veterinary systems of the U.S. were really stretched by the war. There was a doctor's draft. A lot of uh, physicians were put in, the, uh, in uniform. Uh, in fact, osteopaths were not sushered to the draft. They had a big surge of popularity because they were the only kind of physicians people could see. Um, the Army had special decontamination units at several facilities out west, generally 12 guys, and they were trained to carry all their gear out into the back country and decontaminate um, a site with ammonia. Uh, and here's the crazy thing, the Army did not tell its soldiers why they were doing that. It was that, okay, you got to hang around, we, we might call you, keep training guys, uh, make sure you're physically fit. Um, some of the uh, investigation units had physicians that um, they had to, to check out if there were any disease causing things in the balloons, but uh, after a while they said, we don't need these 45 year old physicians trooping through the mountains and getting exhausted. So, and again, there was no evidence that the balloons carried nasty stuff like chemical or biological weapons. Okay, a final countermeasure is denial of information to the Japanese. Okay, in December 44, there's a newspaper article about a balloon landing in, uh, I think it's Montana. And then a couple weeks later, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, says that, uh, yeah, there were two balloons discovered. They might carry spies. And uh, we're, uh, we're going to investigate with the Army. And after that, there is absolutely no mention in the media whatsoever. Now, the Japanese had counted on the American media of just covering this up the wazoo. They considered Americans a gossipy people. I think they're right. But back then, the government had some pretty strong weapons to use against the media if they didn't comply. Now, censorship was voluntary for the news media. However, paper was a strictly rationed commodity. And if a newspaper or magazine did not comply with the government's suggestions. They didn't get anything to publish with it. Radio, that was different. The government controlled the airwaves, so the radio stations had to abide by it. Okay, they aggressively enforced the authorities. I've been through the archives and seen requests. Gee, can we talk about this? No, you cannot talk about this. And it even went so far is that a balloon appeared in a comic strip. And you'll see in a minute why it appeared in a comic strip. And this storyline, who remembers Smiling Jack? Yeah, I, they, they quit carrying it by the time I was a kid, but anyway. Um, so we'll never know what happened to Winnie and D Jungle Jolly with the balloon. Uh, but. The blanket started to unravel in May of 45, and it took place in Oregon, here's Portland, and it was down near uh, Bly, which is in the interior part of Oregon. A church picnic went out, and they went to a parking lot, and the uh, pastor is parking the car and the pastor's wife and the kids are setting up for the picnic and one of the kids goes, hey, look at this. And you see these two chaps right here? They're Forest Service people. They were at the other end of the parking lot. They knew about the balloons. They were getting ready to tell the pastor to get the kids away and then there was an explosion. Um, and this is the only photo I found in the archives that I could actually show to an audience. High explosive does nasty things to people. 
uh, on that. The people. Um, The people in the area were really mad that these, people, that these kids died out of nowhere. And the initial response from the government was pretty stupid. No other way of putting it out. They go, since kids are killed, we're going to concentrate on children. Telling them, don't go into the forest and pick up weird things. So what do you think happened? The kids go home, mom and dad, what's all these weird things in the bush? Well, I don't know. And so to the, you know, the, the Forest Telegraph, people are really mad about this. Why are the kids being no notified about this? How come we're not? They killed their congressman. And so the um, casualties uh, were hit in April. Then in May, they had a release of information, both in the newspapers and uh, Time Magazine, Newsweek, and it was generally just that right there. Sporadics attack, landed or damaged, no damage in property. They don't talk about damage to human beings. And um, the news media knew about it. And from May of 45 to the end of the war, it was almost comic on how in trying to send out enough information but not too much how the government fumbled the ball. The head of the Forest Service was interviewed on a radio network and he even gave information that was supposed to be kept secret. And one of the biggest security breaches happened at the end of May. Toronto Daily Star, they had this headline in their late edition and it was cleared by the Canadian censor in Toronto. The Canadian censors in the western part of Canada, they, they didn't let something like that be it. And they had to yank that newspaper as quickly as possible. Okay, but it was the most effective countermeasure in fighting the balloons because the Japanese gave up after getting no feedback on how successful or unsuccessful the balloon attack was. Uh, they were getting bombed by the spring of 45, and they figured we have to use the manpower, the resources uh, to fight, you know, the Americans that are bombing the heck out of us. Okay. And one final strange thing took place in March, and this wasn't revealed for like 30 years. Uh, Hanford, Washington is where the nuclear bomb project, the Manhattan Project, was building plutonium, which was the key uh, element of an atomic bomb. You've seen Oppenheimer. It's three hours long. Uh, it's a good movie. You see a lot of, uh, no, no, I won't go there. Um, anyway, what happened was one of these balloons hit against the power lines leading into the Hanford facility and it knocked the electricity out to the reactor that is making the plutonium for the bomb. Now what happened to that reactor in Japan about a decade ago? Uh, you could have a meltdown. Fortunately the backup plan worked. Um, and the interesting thing is the scientists in charge of that, they didn't try to shut the reactor off uh, as a, a test run to see if it would work, because they didn't know if it would work. Unfortunately, it did. So the Japanese almost sabotaged the atomic bomb. Came very close to it, which is pretty ironic. Okay. Now, here's the extent of the balloons geographically, 285. This was discovered during the war. Afterwards, it's probably about 320 all told. Um, and uh, listing by state, the balloons actually landed where the Japanese kind of aimed them, the Pacific Northwest, because that's where the jet stream was. 
but you see two landed in Michigan. And here's the Great Lakes State. And one landed in West Michigan, and the other in the Detroit suburb of Farmington. Okay, uh, this is not a period map, but it landed right on the border of Kent and Allegan County. And if you go to Allegan County today, that is a booming suburb of Grand Rapids. But back then, it was pretty much a farmland. Uh, and one, um, let's go back one. Yeah, this is fe late February. 45. Three boys are playing around after school and they see this balloon coming towards them. And it is just coming down kind of fast and it lands in this field. And here are the three boys, Buzz Bailey, Robert and Ken Fine, brothers. And this is what they found the balloon. They had an envelope, they had some rope, they had some bird rope, some S-hooks, and then here's the uh, uh, pressure release valve. And okay, these were boys in their, uh, you know, around 10 years old. They were just thrilled. Look at this. We got this big envelope. We got all this rope. Rope was scarce for farmers during the war. And they convinced an older boy who had a pickup truck, and they took it. Oops. They took it to the Fine family farmhouse, where Mrs. Fine, who's on the left, was entertaining the local Catholic priest. That is not the local Catholic priest we picture. <laughs> yes, but uh, they come in. Hey, look at this neat thing we have, and the priest is the voice of region. Now, boys. We think, I think, this is a government weather balloon. You should wait for the authorities to come pick it up. Of course, the kids are mad, uh, but it's stored in the basement in a couple days. Some FBI, not, not FBI agents, some Army agents. By this time, J. Edgar Hoover has given up on the FBI investigating balloons. The Army guys goes, um, okay, we're taking this. It's from Japan. Don't tell anybody about it. They, they lose that. And frankly, until I went to their farmhouse in the mid-80s, they didn't know what happened after that. Well, what happened was that uh, actually the FBI was involved in this. I'm sorry about that. I, this is a frustrating picture for me. It's a law enforcement officer it looks like he has a badge on his vest, and it looks like, to me, the map on his left is a map of Grand Rapids from you know, the World War II era. And if you notice in the background, you see other parts of the envelope. Um, the envelope and the other material was sent to the Navy, which was the uh, lead agency for lighter than air craft. Uh, but the FBI agents in Michigan really didn't like it because they were getting all these top secret documents that they had to keep on their person and in a safe and they had to carry guns and it was a pain and the biggest pain was the newspaper guys they heard about it and they go can we talk about it and they're going no 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 you can't talk about it um, so the uh, balloon envelope gets sent to the naval air technical command on the east coast uh, and in February of 47, a chap named Don Picard uses that balloon envelope to get his military ballooning license. How did this happen? Well, Picard came from a ballooning family. And this is a case of the Navy putting a round peg in a round hole. They had him work at the facility that investigated the balloons. And at the end of the war, they go, okay, uh, we'll give you one of these balloons. I mean, you come from a ballooning family? And he goes, sure, that's great. 
So he takes it back. He enrolls in the University of Minnesota. He's in the uh, Army ROTC. And uh, he uses helium uh, to uh, get the balloon up, and he gets his uh, military balloonist license uh, for that. Now, in February of 2017, WZZM in Grand Rapids has a nice special about this. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Brent Ashcroft, the reporter, he contacts Don Picard, who was the guy who uh, got the balloon, and uh, he sells it to the uh, Byron Center Museum. And they're now trying to get a building up so they can display the balloon. And they can start their balloon. Okay. Now notice I have two dates on the Farmington one. And uh, of course this map shows all the expressways. And actually when I started to research this, they were building 696. So for me, trying to get into uh, Farmington and Farmington Hill was a bit of a challenge. But uh, the balloon lands right north of the Eight Mile Road on Gill Road. Uh, uh, Farmington's Acres, where it must be a neighborhood. And uh, that's the home of John T. Cook. Well, in March of 45, one Sunday afternoon, he looks out and an uh, adjacent field, it's his field, he sees a fire going on. And he's going, that's kind of strange. And the fire goes out, he doesn't think of anything about it. And then in the springtime, he starts working on his garden. And he sees a strange looking tin can. And he goes, oh, who knows what this is. And then the word comes out, the very sparse information about Japanese balloons. And he thinks, let me look at a tin can again. And he thinks it might be an incendiary from a Japanese balloon. And fortunately for him, one of his neighbors is a state police sergeant. And he gives it to the sergeant. And uh, a couple days later, some FBI guys and state troopers come. And they take it, and they say, yeah, this came from Japan, don't talk about it. And so uh, this causes a brouhaha in Michigan. Are we going to get more of these things? How come they haven't told us about it? Because the FBI and the Army didn't tell the state police that a balloon had landed in West Michigan. So what do good bureaucrats do when they have a problem? They hold a conference. And in this conference, they... Uh, nail down all the procedures, and the biggest point of contention was who gets the responsibility if one of these balloons is shot down and causes damage? So even like 80 plus years ago, liability was a problem, and eventually the uh, Army Air Corps goes, yeah, we'll take responsibility. So what I think happened was that this was a case of the Japanese balloon working as advertised. The balloon dropped a high explosive bomb, or no, dropped an incendiary out of nowhere, causes a fire. Nobody knows what happens. And then that's it. You know, silently, the balloon probably landed in Canada someplace. So, okay. How come you haven't heard about it? Well, when Japan surrendered, there were a lot of different stories about a lot of stuff. Uh, and a lot of classified material got released. And um, actually, there were riots in both the U.S. and Canada that kind of rivaled the uh, celebratory sports riots that our hallowed universities had. In fact, in uh, Halifax, at the end of the war in Germany, the uh, sailors and soldiers smacked into all the bars to get the booze. But anyway, you have a lot of competing news items, and uh, you know, that went away. But then during the Cold War, the U.S. used the same theories, the same basic technology, 
same principles for spy and anti-crop warfare balloons. And we did spend spy balloons against the Soviet Union, and we had about as much luck in getting good intelligence pictures about the Soviet military effort as the Japanese did in causing major damage to the U.S. And fortunately, cooler heads of the U.S. government said we're not going to have crop warfare against the Soviets. Okay. Um, when we went into Afghanistan over 20 years ago in an Al-Qaeda building on a whiteboard, I don't know if you can see it carefully, uh, well, there was a drawing of a balloon. I uh, don't know if Al-Qaeda did anything. But then Hamas used regular party balloons to drop bombs on Israel. And of course, as we know, they didn't stop there. Now, the final thing about the balloons was, uh, I want to talk about is the Peace Crane Project. You of Michigan professor, uh, John Tak Takashita, he was in an internment camp out west during the war. And after the war, he found out about the balloon that caused the casualties near Bly, Oregon. And he started researching that. And when he found out that schoolgirls from Japan were making the balloons, he got into contact with them. And of course, they didn't know what they were working. And so they got together and they had these peace cranes, which looked like that at the uh, sent to Bly, Oregon, uh, as uh, kind of condolences for the, uh, the work they had done. Okay, now normally this would be the end of my talk, but you are getting the premier Chinese spy balloon information, <laughs> which took place almost a year ago. Um, like this photo because the U-2 pilot took a selfie of the balloon and you see the shadow of his plane. Now this is about 100,000 feet in altitude. You can see the curvature of the earth. I think if the U-2 pilot got any higher, he could probably get an astronaut wings uh, on that. It's a pretty good shot of the balloon. Uh, solar panels and then some other gear there. Okay, now, as you would expect, the technology has improved. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, high altitude research. Even Google's been in on it. They gave it up because it was so expensive. But this NASA balloon is the size of a football stadium, flies at 110,000 feet. It doesn't need ballast to stay at altitude. I'm not sure how that works. It's propelled by the wind and it has a combination of helium and hydrogen. So the state of the art has advanced. Now there's different kind of balloons and the Japanese balloon was what's known as a free balloon. It's wind blown. This is a hot air balloon in Berlin that got into trouble. It's almost ready to crash. Uh, I think the, uh, the passengers were a bit disconcerted about that. And then there's other kinds of inflatables. You have um, airships, which is controlled flight. On the right, we have a blimp. Uh, it's like a regular kiddies balloon. You just blow it up and it has that shape. But then you have something called a dirigible, which is on the left. Uh, it has an internal flame. It has bags where the uh, helium or hydrogen was. Okay, can anybody identify this city here? Detroit. Yep, Detroit in, in 1931. That is the German Graf Zeppelin flying over. And if my father is believed, to be believed, he said he saw it from the ground it had three or four Ford trimotors flying around it and they were dwarf. They looked like insects. Over it. And that was a passenger balloon. 1931. Yeah, you can uh, go to the Detroit News Archive and see more pictures of it. And the Chinese balloon is a hybrid. It's a regular balloon, but 
Uh, it did ride on the jet stream, um, and it could be controlled since it exhibited, quote, according to Scientific American, limited capability for directional control over places, so it could kind of hover over places. And when this thing was floating over the U.S., people said, well, it's going over our bases. I'm not sure if that's true. One thing about this is that there is a lot we don't know and there's a lot we're not going to know. Because this is a national security secret and the Japanese balloon information didn't get sent out into the 70s. So we're going to have to wait a long time to um, find out exactly what was all in it, if we find out or not. But uh, this shot shows the solar panels and then you have this girder here uh, that's probably where they had the payload, but who knows, they had a lot of space to put things in. You said something was the size of a school bus? Yeah, that's what they were saying, yeah. Okay, uh, what are spy balloons? Goes going to operate off the radar, controlled by the wind, camera, uh, you could have radar systems in it. Uh, low cost between 24,000 and 3,700 meters, which translates to about 30,000, uh, the Japanese balloons flew about 30,000 feet. Um, and as you can see in this chart, they went between the Chinese balloon between 80,000 and 120,000 feet. Fire aircraft flies at uh, 65,000. Japanese balloons were about 35,000. Um, some people think this was a breakthrough in regulating the internal temperature of a balloon. Um, there was disagreement about how much intelligence the Chinese were able to gather. And there was no weaponry in the payload. You can see it could carry cameras, radar, sensors, communications. And, and again, they're not telling us. Now, the people involved in the Google Balloon, they said this shape, it kind of looks like a pumpkin, that's probably the most efficient shape for high altitude. Um, and the shoot down, uh, shot down by an F 22 Raptor, which maximum altitude 65,000 feet. Uh, the balloon's going about 80,000, 120,000, who knows for sure. Um, helium. Of course, some other people say it was mixed gas. Uh, the sidewinder it utilized. Um, they didn't know if the sidewinder could operate that high up. But some people were wondering, why didn't you just use the cannons in the plane to shoot it down? Well, the plane couldn't get that high up there. And um, we can see the corridor is kind of the jet stream. But it was around those red, the state, the red states, or where you know, uh, military facilities were at. Um, and this is a British newspaper's graphic, uh, invaluable intelligence recorded. I don't know if it's in invaluable for the Chinese or for us. Um, now, impacts, here's the balloon going down. Um, there is now more emphasis on high altitude research. Uh, some parts of the Defense Department goes, well, next time we're going to capture one of these darn things. I don't know how, but they, they think they can. Uh, they need to detect it better, and it's not just one way, it's radar and God knows what else. Um, the balloons probably wouldn't carry bombs like the Japanese ones, um, but uh, has anybody ever heard of EMP? It's electric. Yeah. Okay. Can uh, somebody tell us what EMP is? Electromagnetic pulse. Okay. And what does that do? Shuts what? down all power stations, all electricity, all sensors, all radar, all communications, all your car mm -hmm. engines, anything electronic. Right. Um, it's indelicately known in. Um, and in some circles as a castration round. Uh, it uh, you know, just, just basically fries all your electronics. So you, you could theoretically do that, can be used, which we think the Chinese did with surveillance. 
uh, military and civilian applications. Civilian, what Google was trying to do was let's have balloons out around third world countries or after major disasters. They could be a, a link for uh, telecommunications. You've got military things. Um, innovations was that most of the balloons, high altitude balloons that are launched are transparent. This Japanese one was opaque. We don't know why. Uh, and they think the China, not, yeah, it's a Chinese balloon, not Japanese. Uh, they might have had a big breakthrough in uh, long endurance light or near technology. And then finally, oh yeah, diplomatic squabbles. The Chinese goes, this was a weather balloon. Why did you shoot that down? And we goes, no, it wasn't. You guys were spying on us. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now it's question time. Yeah. May I have a question? No. No, okay. How did you get interested in researching this? Okay, well. I well, never heard of Japanese. Okay, well. Before. Go, going back to when I was in grad school, uh, which was 73, uh, uh, I got this English airplane magazine. And they go, oh, the Smithsonian monograph talks about these neat Japanese balloons from World War II. And I go, that's, that's interesting. And then uh, a few years later, I'm working at the Colorado State University Library, and I'm bored to tears about <laughs> cataloging veterinary medical journals. And so I go to government documents, and I asked uh, Fred, uh, hey, find this Japanese balloon monograph. It's from the Smithsonian. He finds it to me. And I'm reading it, and I go to the map at the back, and there's a balloon right where Fort Collins, Colorado is, where Colorado State is. And so I start researching it from there. And fortunately, the news, the Fort Collins, Colorado, the newspaper had the best post-war write-up I have ever seen since. Hmm. Uh, about, I mean, it was long. Most of the write-ups in the newspapers were just a few short paragraphs. This thing was really detailed. So I did Freedom of Information Act uh, requests with uh, the FBI, and I went to the National Archives and got going there. Yeah. Did you know that uh, uh, the United States were setting off nukes uh, off of uh, balloons in 1948? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Around there. yeah, that was a good way. Uh, you could definitely have an uh, air burst. Yeah. Because, you know, of course, if you drop it, it's kind of hard to calibrate it when it explodes. If you have it hung by a balloon, you know exactly how high it is, and so then you can yeah. make all your calculations. Have you seen a movie called EMP 333 Days? No. That's the full title. It's, this, it's, it's not an action movie, mm -hmm. but it's a, it, it'll make you think. Is it a documentary? or? I uh, know, it's a full length. Uh, yeah. About an hour and twenty minutes, yeah. you know. It's a 2018 movie. It's outstanding, I tell you, man. And well, I saw that before the Chinese balloons coming in, and I'm starting to think, oh man. Uh, yeah. Can you mind holding this for a sec? Look that. Sure. Let's see if we could bring that up. Oops. Oops. Okay. All right. Chris, how do I get on the internet? Uh, that one might not connect in here. Oh no. Let me Google Chrome, let's see. Yeah, it's a long title, but it was EMP yeah. 333 days. Let's see. Oh, no internet. Sorry. I was hoping to find it on the internet movie database, but okay, any any other questions? Well, uh, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like a question sure. you were talking about the the big like, I remember yeah. when we were in school we uh, 
one of our uh, readers, they had like a unit of uh, the military and talked about the big, like, uh, are they commonly used today or no? Not a whole lot. You don't hear much about it. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, generally hear about it in antique radios from the 40s. Um, but I think they were, uh, the problem with Bakelite is that with age it got, um, what's the right term, fragile. Kind of like a glass jaw, it would uh, crack really easily, um, which is the problem. Uh, you know, most, cl most plastic is, is a little more durable than Bakelite, I don't think it was. But, you know, the ma major thing was that it was, you know, when they wanted to be, I heard another kind of like, I don't know if they still have them, but I know, I remember when I was very young, they did that. I remember that time they had a light bulb trouble light, and I was just wondering how, how common those are in the very day. That's news for me. Trouble, trouble, TRO. Yeah, it's like trouble, a trouble light. It's a signal that you're possibly going to be trouble. I don't know about that one. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Anybody else? Okay, well, again, thanks a whole lot. Appreciate you coming out.